Hi. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway, and welcome to the Odd Lots Variety Show. It's our first ever live event, and we're so happy to have you all here. Um, I have to say, I'm a little disappointed because I wanted our first Odd Lots live event to be an Odd Lots live poker tournament, but this is also cool. I'm not disappointed. Uh, just a couple notes before we start. We have some really, really great people backstage, some guests that we've been wanting to get on the podcast for a very long time. One housekeeping note, this is being recorded in audio format, of course. It's also being recorded in video format, so please just be mindful of that. And other than that, enjoy the show. One other thing, we don't have time for Q&A, unfortunately, but we'll have cocktails and reception afterwards. You can hang out and then mingle and ask questions that you didn't get a chance to uh, ask, so let's yep. get started. All right, our first guest is a criminal. It's a conv an actual convicted felon. He is the former CFO of Crazy Eddie, which for any uh, longtime New Yorker may remember their ads in the 70s and 80s. He was an electronics retailer, uh, also a fraud through and through from the beginning. Uh, and so we have the CFO. He now does work on forensic accounting. And I uh, want to bring in Sam Anta. Uh, so who are you? <laughs> what do you do? I'm a retired criminal. Are you a reformed criminal? No. Okay. <laughs> you think I'd be here right now if I didn't get caught? Well, maybe I would as a legitimate CEO that hasn't gotten caught yet. Do criminals ever truly retire? Yeah, because, you know, after a while, you know, it's, it, um, you know what, what's, what's, what's the benefit of doing any more crime? Even though at times I feel like I'd love to do crime again. After meeting some of the people in this room here, I said, oh man, this would be easy just to go back into the game again. <laughs> so tell us about uh, how you got into the business and what was Crazy Eddie and how did you become its CFO? Crazy Eddie's was a small garden variety uh, electronics uh, operation. Uh, we engaged mostly in income tax evasion. Stealing the sales tax gave us the competitive advantage because that 6 or 7% we can steal gave us the opportunity to discount more to customers and still make money. So we were pretty much uh, being competitive by, you know, by, by uh, evading taxes in the old days. Uh, the, it was a family-oriented business. We wanted to grow, and they wanted somebody in the inside family member to, uh, to be the CFO of the company if the company grew to a certain level. So they picked me because I was the nerd that read the Wall Street Journal and Barron's when he was 12 years old. So they put me through college so I can become an accountant to help them commit more sophisticated crimes in the future. So eventually I go to Baruch College right over here on 23rd Street, I get my CPA, and of course I become a criminal mastermind, you know, doing white collar crime. And when, I went to college to become an effective white-collar criminal. White-collar criminals should never cheat themselves out of getting a good education. So I wasn't <laughs> one of those kids that cheated in school or anything. I earned my grades because I wanted to be the best at what I was doing in crime. Did you know that was the ultimate destination, was yes, crime at the time? Yes, And you were okay with that? Yeah, okay. why not? And it was fun. So I made a lot of money. So when, you know, when I was 14 years old, I got a $1,500 bonus in 1971 in cash. Does anybody have any 14-year-old kids? Imagine if your kid came home with a $1,500 cash bonus today, even. And, and the money, of course, is not worth as much as it was back then. Go ahead. So what was the most useful thing you learned mm. from accounting up for a life of criminality? Is that people are very, very gullible. People are too trusting. Uh, as a criminal, I learned to consider your humanity as a weakness to be exploited in the execution of my crimes. In other words, your good nature, your wanting to trust people, you wanting to give people the benefit of the doubt, that gave me the opportunity to execute my crimes. Second part is, is that people are, um, you steal more with a smile than you can with a gun. Anybody knows how I was working the crowd here, shaking hands, smiling, and everybody was happy with me, right? You see, if, you, if people like you, it's easier to steal from them because they feel like they're comfortable with you. So let's talk, uh, that's nice and theoretical, but let's talk practical. So. Obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would like to steal the income tax or the uh, sales tax that they owe, but you have auditors who are forced to come in. So how do you like dupe the people whose job it is 
to make sure that you're not uh, stealing. When it comes to fraud, the distraction is always more important than the lie. Now, lying's not a problem. You can ask me any question here, and I'll lie to you right to your face, as you will know the difference. But the point is, is that if you can distract somebody from doing their job, chances are they're not going to ask you the question that you have to lie about. So in the Crazy Eddie case, let's take auditors. The audits would be done over a period of, say, eight weeks. So they'd have to be 12.5% each week, right? So by week six out of eight, they should have 75% of their work done in 75% of the time, and 25% of the work left to do in 25% of the time. My job was to stall them by having only 25% of the work done in 75% of the time, so that they had have to do 75% of the work in only 25% of the time, which would cause them to cram, rush to get things done, and miss key audit procedures and it worked every single year. Do you know why? Because in the 1980s, there were no females in accounting. There were none. It was a male-dominated profession, and most of the legwork was done by 21 to 25-year-old kids fresh out of college that were single. And what's the easiest way to distract the male auditor from doing their jobs? Female accountants. As beautiful as you. And they, would, they spend most of their time flirting with the females instead of doing their jobs. And every single year, like Pavlov with the dog, you put the food in front of the dog, it salivates. Well, you put the female in front of the accountant, they salivate, they don't even do anything else. That's pretty much how we were able to succeed at uh, frauds. We didn't get caught because of our auditors. We got caught because somebody thought that Crazy A's was a gold mine. And they took advantage of a drop in the stock price and they took over the company right from out under us. In other words, we were benefited, we were, we were a victim of our own fraud. Now, oh, I was gonna say, talk to us about that moment. What happened when, when you heard that someone was actually interested in the company and you knew that it was a fraud? Well, we tried to take it over at $7 a share. We thought we knew that people were, were hunting the company to take it over. So we made a bid at $7 a share. And they say, why are you going to pay $7 a share for a company you know, you, you know is worthless? Because we weren't going to use our money anyway. We're going to defraud the idiots on Wall Street, take all their money, have them finance the takeover, and we're going to get 35% of the company for nothing. So we bid $7 a share. And guess what? Some idiot out there actually bid $8 a share thinking that we were trying to steal the company. In fact, the initial investigation into the Crazy Eddie fraud, the SEC thought that we deliberately understated our numbers to take over the company on the cheap. <laughs> well, I want to like back up a second. What is the difference, and we, we, uh, Sam was a guest on, our, uh, on a recorded podcast, and I thought this was one of the most key ideas, that he said, there is a difference in the nature of fraud when you're a private company versus a public company. Right, I think this is very important. The economics of crime change when you go public. So what's the difference? You get a better bang for the buck. Overstating your income as a public company, even if it means overpaying your taxes, than understating your income as a private company and evading your taxes. For instance, if I steal a million dollars from my own company as a private company. In other words, I skim a million dollars and I don't show it as income. And we have a 40% tax rate. I'm evading $400,000 in taxes. Simple math, right? $1 million, 40%, $400,000, right? If I now am a public company and I put that million dollars back into the company, right? I have an inflated pre-tax income of $1 million. I'm going to overpay my taxes by $400,000. I'm going to have an inflated net income of $600,000. And if my company is trading at a multiple of earnings, let's say 30 times earnings, P-E ratio, I'm creating $18 million in fictitious wealth by overpaying my taxes by $400,000. Guess who owns most of the stock? The crazy Eddie people. The Antar family does. We created a securities fraud by going legit. We said it was more profitable to screw investors than to, than to screw the Internal Revenue Service. That was the whole thing, idea behind the crazy Eddie fraud. OK, I'm going to jump forward again. Uh, what was it like in prison? And did you do a, a Shawshank Redemption kind of thing where you started doing everyone's uh, tax accounting for well, my them? Kids, my kids are here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, believe it or not, I didn't, I didn't go to prison. I got house arrest. And when they were young, because they were too young to be traumatized by what was going on, they'd see daddy wearing an ankle bracelet. So they'd bring their friends over <laughs> to show off their daddy's ankle did bracelet. You, so did you yeah. tell on your own family members? 
Uh, yes, but not my immediate family, my cousins. Yes, of course, absolutely. <laughs> you think I'm going to go to jail for them? Have to have some standards. Yeah, some so, standards. One thing I'm very curious about, and we just have a couple minutes left, is these days with computers and all kinds of more ease, you know, ease of tracking inventory, is it harder to do fraud these days? No, or is it crime evolves. I'll give you one, one example, computers and everything. One of the things, one of the questions raised by Wall Street prior to us going public was whether we had an adequate computer system, which we didn't. So what do we do? We get um, um, Computer World magazine to bring one of their beautiful female reporters over, right? And she writes this story about uh, Crazy Eddie's computer system that tracks inventory. And we put a nice lady in, you know, with, with a mini skirt in front of the computers and all the red, the orange and yellow lights are going on and people think we have a great computer system. <laughs> if <laughs> it's that simple. Traction's always more important than the life. If you were gonna do a fraud today, in modern times, what would it be? Multi-level marketing or timeshares, because it's legitimate fraud. I see people, I've done work on the forensic side on that. I see people getting fleeced all the time by these industries pretending to be legitimate businesses. I mean, they, they might be good investments for Wall Street. I'm not here to talk about investments, and actually I haven't been in the market for over a decade. But I will tell you, these, these, these companies are the scum of American capitalism. They're the ruination of American capitalism. They should not be allowed to exist. All right. Sam Antar, the uh, former CFO of Crazy Eddie, thank you very much for your uh, lessons on fraud. Thank you. All right. So moving uh, swiftly along, uh, we're going to bring up our next panel. And those of you that listen to Odd Lots know that obviously we talk a lot about financial markets on the show. And I, I think sometimes there's a tendency to think that markets are sort of divorced from people's day-to-day -day lives when, in fact, they matter a lot to how everyone lives. So for our next panel, we're going to focus on some big moments in the debt market specifically, um, and big moments in the debt market that have actually changed the world in various ways. Our next two panelists are um, Brad Setzer, an American economist and former staff economist at the Treasury Department. Many of you probably follow him on Twitter, and if you don't, you definitely should, because he has great insights. And we also have Lee Bookheit, who's been described uh, previously as the philosopher king of sovereign debt lawyers. He's represented nearly every country that's gone bankrupt since the 1980s and really reshaped the way that we think about sovereign debt. Uh, his mere presence at airports have been known to move a country debt market. Uh, and he's recently retired from the law firm Cleary Gottlieb, and we managed to get him out of his uh, semi-retirement to come talk to us. So very exciting. Let's bring them on. Right, uh, so we purposefully gave ourselves a really sort of uh, vague intro, which means I now have to struggle to think what the first question is. But I, I think we wanna focus on debt crises to begin with. Do they all look the same? Is there a common thread? How do you actually spot a debt crisis coming? Lee, let's start with you. They don't all look the same, uh, but they have one thing in common. They're all a crisis um, <laughs> and they never, come in isolation. A sovereign debt crisis will almost always be accompanied by a banking crisis or trade crisis, a currency crisis, sometimes a social crisis. Uh, the pressure on the politicians uh, who are there when the crisis begins is intense because they all know that history suggests that the politicians there when a crisis begins are rarely the ones there when it ends. Mm. Brad, uh, by the way, I just want to tell a little quick anecdote about <laughs> Brad because we're here. So I think it was probably 14 years ago and I was like unemployed, I hadn't been in New York that long. I applied for a job uh, to like blog about economics or something and Brad was my uh, interviewer and I bombed the interview and I didn't get the job. Uh, but we, it's because it, he asked me about Argentina had just defaulted a couple of years ago. And he asked me some question about Argentina. I was like, I just, you know, BS my way through it. I had no idea. Uh, so I bombed. I didn't get it. But 
We're now here, and I'm, uh, you know, he's in the hot seat. So, and once again, Argentina is in the news. Uh, so, Brad, why does Argentina, first of all, uh, second of all, uh, why does Argentina, uh, why do they default so much? What's the deal with that? Um, well, uh, I made probably one of the biggest hiring mistakes in my no. life. Um, <laughs> we, we'd actually had hired Felix Salmon who turned out to be a pretty so good that was blogger. an even bigger mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we could have put together Felix and Joe and like uh, probably been a successful blogging firm. Um, so why does Argentina default so much? I guess it's because people lend them so much money. Okay, why do people keep lending them money? Because this seems to happen literally at this point almost every five years. I think people consistently overestimate Argentina's capacity to repay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Thank I you mean, for your insight. I, uh, <laughs> uh, the, I, this kind of gets like wonky sovereign daddy. That's why we're here. <laughs> uh, Argentina doesn't have a big export base. It exports soybeans and uh, soybean oil. It hasn't developed other export industries. So exports are a very small share of Argentina's economy. If you have a small share of exports, you have less capacity to support foreign currency debt. Yet Argentina keeps borrowing in foreign currency. Well, so, oh, sorry, Brad. So, but, I mean, essentially every time you, what would normally be a currency move, a depreciation, mm. it turns into a debt crisis. So I described Lee's career saying that he's represented in, in numerous uh, governments. So give us your opinion on why those governments keep tapping the market for money that apparently they can't actually afford. Look, in the 21st century, no sovereign borrows money in the international markets with the expectation that they'll ever have to repay it. If by repay you mean devote current resources to settle that liability. They borrow it in the sure and certain hope that when it matures, they will be able to go back into the market and borrow from someone else to pay that back. And when that matures, they'll do the same so on in perpetuity. Uh, I sometimes think of sovereign debt that it used to be a joke that if you had a pal who was on a diet and you saw them about to tuck into a chocolate eclair, you were supposed to say to them, now remember, a moment on the lips, a lifetime on the hips. <laughs> sovereign debt is that. When a sovereign borrows money today, uh, that debt in a net sense, will probably stay on its balance sheet forever. Uh, that, which is why sovereign uh, debt stocks uh, almost always go up. They will occasionally go down, but almost always go up relentlessly, remorselessly. Well, Brad, you mentioned that Argentina is particularly ill-suited to take on foreign currency debt due to its uh, immature export base. Why not adopt a different model? Why do they have to borrow from, uh, bo borrow from international markets? Well, I mean, they have at times tried a different model. I mean, for better or for worse, the Kirshners were frozen out of the market for a long period of time. They still kind of wanted to run budget deficits, so they kind of borrowed from the central bank to uh, finance government spending. Macri came along and said, I wanted to go back to be a more legitimate form of finance. Uh, and Argentina, in addition to having a small export sector, has a really small banking sector. You know, lots of historical reasons, the history of inflation. So we couldn't finance the budget deficit with the banking sector. The market was there, and the temptation was strong. Uh, Lee, should they, do a, um, should they do a different approach? And I'm also curious, like, after Mockery won, everyone's like, yay, he's going to do all the liberal reforms that people want, and the IMF is excited because they're going to do some playbook. And obviously, as we've seen over the last several months, it's completely failed. How much burden is there on the, or I say responsibility, on the international community, whether it's organizations like the IMF, to try that playbook again 
and sort of think like, you know, how much is it their fault for adopting this pattern that just isn't working? Well, there's a curious asymmetry in the international financial markets. Uh, organizations like the IMF, every year, by their articles of agreement, will send a team of economists down to every one of their members, analyze the fiscal policies, and usually criticize them, sometimes brutally. But they have no power at that stage to get the country to change policy. It is only when the country cannot pay its debts and comes to the IMF and asks for a program that the IMF can begin to say, you must uh, adopt these fiscal adjustment measures. It's a curious asymmetry. It's as though the medical profession uh, was unable uh, to tell patients to avoid smoking cigarettes that they could only uh, help them when they come in with the consequences of it. So is the solution to debt crises, does it always have to be fiscal adjustment or austerity, or are there alternatives that are just never pursued? Well, debt crises, you, you started this question, Tracy. Debt qu crises come in different forms. Sometimes, often, I guess, they are caused by chronic fiscal mismanagement of the economy, but not always. Um, there have been debt crises caused by natural disasters, the hurricane, the, the earthquake, the tidal wave. Uh, debt crises can be caused by a Lehman moment in the international markets. Uh, debt crises can be caused by some other sovereign, some other place in the world, uh, misbehaving or uh, the victim of gross misfortune, which causes the investor community to recoil. Mm -hmm. And it, it's almost like you're seeing them wake up and remember the risks of sovereign lending, and then they pull back. And when they pull back, uh, going back to my earlier uh, analogy, uh, when all the debt is assumed to be refinanceable, mm. and it no longer is refinanceable, then there's a debt crisis. Mm. Brad, do you think some other model should be pursued? I mean, let's say you could go back in time to after, right after Mockery wins the election or some other point, was there another path that plausibly could have uh, been taken by Argentina to avoid this? And I don't mean like, you know, more austerity per se, because for whatever, you know, it's tough, but. Uh, was there like a totally different approach they could have taken? I, in Argentina's particular case, there were choices, uh, but I'm not sure the choices would have avoided some form of austerity. Uh, one choice would have been to borrow more in pesos, uh, not to borrow in dollars. I mean, you get into debt trouble most typically when you borrow in a currency that is not your own. There may be some differences across cases, but that's the, the commonality. Otherwise, you can sort of print your way out of the crisis. Uh, so once Macri decided not to borrow into, in pesos, I think they were on a, a difficult trajectory. So you could have borrowed more in pesos. You could have retained some of the capital controls, tried to lock in the domestic investors and force them to keep buying Argentina's debt. Uh, and in that world, if you had not been relying as heavily on the central bank for financing, you probably would have had to have run smaller fiscal deficits at the time. The other question which sort of Lee avoided is that once you get into trouble and once you default, then it becomes a question of how much you want to pay back. Uh, and so one way of avoiding too much austerity after you have stopped paying is to strike a generous deal with your creditors and give yourself a fresh start. Right, on this note, Lee, do you hate creditors? No, certainly not. <laughs> um, look, the uh, countries, all countries, but particularly developing economies, can benefit enormously from access to capital markets if it is done with moderation and maturity. Uh, the problem, and this goes to Joe's, Joe's, you were dancing around this, but the answer to your question is that the political flesh is notoriously weak. Look, 
Politicians like to spend money. It helps them get reelected. Politicians don't like to tax because it doesn't help them get reelected. They don't like to cut services because that doesn't help them. Uh, borrowing, particularly borrowing from outside your own country, so in the international markets, is the way to cover that deficit. Uh, uh, it allows you to spend money without raising taxes, um, and for as long as it lasts, it's a wonderful thing. Um, but uh, the problem is, it is, for most politicians, too tempting and uh, they will borrow often to the saturation point of what the market will lend them. And that is where global economics comes in. If you live in a time as we have for 10 years, in which the central banks, the major central banks of the world have driven interest rates to near zero and have pumped massive amounts of liquidity into the market through quantitative easing and similar programs, there's enormous amount of money sloshing around that will need a home, and they will f f f welcome a borrower willing to take it. So there you have a confluence of two dangerous things, a, a tendency of politicians to borrow as much as they can, and a tendency of a market, not a tendency, a financial imperative to lend money to someone at the best interest rate they can. Let's talk about a country that's even worse shape by a long shot, I think, than uh, Argentina, and uh, that is Venezuela. And Tracy mentioned, Lee, that you were in retirement, but give it all the ruction. Semi-retirement. Semi-retirement. So you are um, involved in some way in uh, Venezuela, but you're not working for Maduro, right? No. Okay. So what's going what, uh What's your, what are you doing with uh, Venezuela? Yeah, I am acting as uh, what we're calling a strategic advisor to the Guaido administration in Venezuela. And what's on the agenda for helping them, and how much can you actually do as long as Maduro is clinging onto power? Well, that's the problem. Until that man takes the hint uh, <laughs> that he should exit the political stage, there isn't much that can be done with respect to the country's external debt. The country owes north of 150 billion US dollars. Uh, its economy has been utterly decimated by 20 years of corruption and grotesque economic mismanagement. Uh, there is a deep humanitarian crisis in the country. There is a serious refugee crisis uh, at, at, you know, s levels proportional to Syria. Um, but uh, there is no possibility of dealing with that debt stock until Mr. Maduro says adios. Mm. Brad, do you have any uh, thoughts on, uh, on any suggestions? The, the approach forward for Venezuela? Well, I mean, Venezuela is going to be like uh, the Super Bowl for sovereign debt lawyers once the restructuring gets started. You have every single possible issue. You have two sovereign borrowers, one sovereign, one quasi-sovereign, the PDVSA, the state oil company, both of whom owe a decent amount in international bonds. The legal uh, equivalence or non-equivalence between their debts is to be determined. Ample scope for creativity. The contractual provisions in Venezuela's bonds are very old school, which means that they have more litigation possibilities and avenues and fewer tools to facilitate a restructuring than a modern uh, restructuring clause would allow. You have uh, an issue of equity between bondholders and sovereign creditors like China, like Russia, but then Russia's played a kind of clever game because Russia hasn't lent necessarily as Russia. Russia has lent as Rosneft, the state oil company, uh, which sort of seems like the sovereign, but it isn't technically the sovereign. You have a whole host of um, court claims uh, for past expropriation, whose relative rank uh, I think is not clear compared to other obligations. Lee may have a different view. And so I think it, uh, it, it 
it has every avenue of complexity that one could ever imagine, combined with the greatest need for debt reduction I think one can imagine. Brad, how important are debt relationships to international politics? Because on the one hand, you are building up a relationship between two companies. This country owes that country some money or vice versa. But on the other hand, you can see it as a point of antagonism when things start to go wrong or whenever there's tensions. And the one I'm thinking about right now is China and the US and $1 trillion plus worth of US treasuries held by China. Uh, look, uh, I've, I probably made my, uh, my name by tracking China's treasury holdings before anyone else thought it was interesting. Uh, and uh, the boring reality is that the treasuries have been the most boring aspect of the, the, the trade war. Uh, China hasn't used them as leverage. Uh, China probably can't use them effectively as leverage. I think China has been disappointed uh, by the fact that its law, you know, its, its treasury holdings, which at one point in time were like 25% of China's GDP, uh, they've kind of come down. Treasury and agencies, to be correct, um, have never really provided them with much leverage over the U.S. political system. Uh, soybean farmers, on the other hand, are a much more potent political force. I think that's partially because the U.S. borrows in its own currency, partially because the Fed can buy far more bonds than China could ever sell, and partially because the relationship with China was always uh, arm's length. The U.S. never really wanted China to accumulate so many reserves, and as a result, uh, the U.S. never uh, promised China uh, much of a return. I think the Chinese learned this. I think one of the one of my theses is that frustration with the lack of leverage provided by treasury bonds contributed to China's decision to lend more mm -hmm. through its policy banks, more through the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. more through direct close relationships, loans to specific politicians, specific companies, and less through a deep liquid bond market like the treasury market. So I don't know if people know this or not, but Tracy has contributed to um, the tensions between the US and China with an article that she wrote uh, a couple of weeks ago. So apparently there's some people that like bought some old Chinese bonds from like the early 1900s, like in an antique shop or something like that, that they just say they're bonds. And now they're trying to lobby the Trump administration to get, uh, to enforce, uh, I mean, you describe it, they want uh, Trump to make China pay them. Sure. They want Trump to basically exert pressure on China to pay this 100-year-old debt that the People's Republic of China actually repudiated back in 1949. So, Lee, we were talking about this earlier. Do, they have, do you think they have any sort of shot at these people who like, picked up some pieces of paper? And wait, 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 wait. Uh, is uh, China going to be represented by Lee? In which case, there's <laughs> no, no shot. <laughs> Legally, I think not. Um, <laughs> uh, whether Mr. Trump wishes to use this or rattle this saber, that I don't know. But these bonds were actually the subject of litigation back in the 1980s, uh, and the courts decided that the statute of limitations had run on these obligations. It isn't just China, by the way. There are czarist Russian bonds for, uh, that went into default in 1917. Uh, they slosh around. Uh, and there was actually a very interesting situation in the, the mid-90s when uh, Russia wanted to issue euro bonds in Europe. The French government said to the Russian government, not until you pay us some money to settle the old czarist bonds uh, that uh, are held by French citizens. And they, they paid them, I think, $500 million to do that. So uh, these things slosh around. It's, it's, there are other countries, by the way, that-, that so There might uh, be a little bit of option value. Something <laughs> could happen where yeah, they're more, worth more than uh, paper, right? Uh, my image is most of these things are framed and on bathroom walls uh, and break the glass when uh, Mr. Trump tells you to. They are beautiful debt certificates. I'm just yes, going to say are. that. They're very gorgeous, and we should all buy them for the art value, at least. Um, 
Lee, we'd be remiss if we didn't ask you in, in your 40 plus year career, what your most interesting moment was jetting in and out of uh, countries often in bankruptcy or on the verge? Um, interesting is a hard adjective, but most tense, I think, was Greece. Uh, Greece in 2010 uh, encountered a terrible debt crisis. Greece, a member of the Eurozone, a member of the European Union, uh, so it had as its domestic currency the euro. Uh, but it wasn't a domestic currency like the Argentine pesos. The Greeks unilaterally couldn't print it. And so in that sense, it was a foreign currency. Um, they owed north of 300 billion uh, euros, uh, uh, virtually all of it in the form of bonds. And uh, the question was, uh, would a debt restructuring for that uh, debt stock force Greece to leave the Eurozone, possibly force it to leave the European Union to bring back the drachma? And that had enormous political consequences across Europe because many in Europe thought that the, uh, the Eurozone, the monetary union, was indissoluble. Uh, and had it proven not to be, might there have been others uh, who would leave? Might the markets have looked at Greece and said, if Greece can restructure, maybe uh, Spain could, maybe Italy could, maybe La Belle France could? And would that not bring a, a, a cataclysm upon European finance? So it was a tense period. Right, we're almost uh, wrapped up. Before we go, um, I just want to turn the subject a little bit because, Brad, I mean, you're, we were talking about U.S.-China and the trade war, and sometimes you come on TV and I say, what's your prediction for the trade war? So with uh, you know, less than a minute to go at this point, what is uh, your prediction for where things are going with U.S.-China trade? I, I, my guess, you know, I, this is one of the cases where you can get on TV simply by reading the president's Twitter account <laughs> and saying that the uh, best predictor of what U.S. trade policy will be will be with the, the tone of his past 10 tweets. Uh, if the past 10 tweets are Jay Powell is the biggest threat to human civilization, then he's probably not thinking uh, about escalating with China. Mm. Uh, if his last 10 tweets are I'm a tariff man, <laughs> he probably is going to escalate with China. So the recent pattern of tweets seem to be back on Jay Powell uh, is not the world's best central banker, <laughs> rather than China is our greatest enemy. So right now I'm putting slightly higher odds on a kind of what's called the mini deal. China buys some soybeans. The US doesn't escalate any further. I don't think the Trump administration really wants to do the last round of tariffs anyway. And then that provides sort of a, an unspoken truce to go through the election. All right. All right. We're going to leave it there. That's Lee Bookite and Brad Setzer. Thank you so much Thank for being both. with us. All right. I have to be very careful with this next intro because it, it's slightly last minute and it's also not on your lineup. It's a surprise guest who we're not going to name. Instead, we're going to bring him out and we're going to play a game. And you all are going to have to guess who he is and you're going to have to do so by asking questions that can be answered in yes or no format. And there are a couple of people in here who I know know who this person is, so please don't ruin it for uh, everyone else. Yes. All right, let's bring him on. The special guest. You can clap even though you don't know who he is. All right, who is it? Who is it? Qu who wants to guess? Shout it out. It's being recorded, so, you know. Try to ask loud. Are you there in red box? <laughs> Keep oh, it, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a yes. Keep, keep, keep it coming. What financial frauds have you committed? 
None. Good, qu good question. Yet. None yet. What's your Twitter handle? Don't, ha don't have one. Ooh. Mystery. <laughs> do you specialize in the repo market? I do not. Barely know what that is. <laughs> You're the Bitcoin guy. No. Good guess, though. That is a good guess. The no. question was, does he work? Do you work on the Odd Lots podcast? No. But you're welcome to, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> I'll come by tomorrow. Right. Are you related to WeWork in any way? What's well, a good question? Are you related Interest, to WeWork? No. I, yeah, I'm interested to know why it was that. But yeah, no. They're in the news, so <laughs> well, yeah, it's plausible yeah, that that okay, could be fair enough, fair a enough. WeWork question. Do you work in Midtown? Do you work in no. Midtown? <laughs> Are you involved in country music? <laughs> Are you involved in? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. No. Unfortunately. Do you have an opinion on platinum coins? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what I you know what I love that like no one is even like anywhere in the ballpark yeah, so far. Yeah, like I bad. I swear none of you have asked a remotely like <laughs> you're not you're not getting warm <laughs> at all. Not even close. Can you play guitar? No. <laughs> if I did I had one. <laughs> do you work for the government? Do you work for the government? Do, I'm kinda young. <laughs> but no, I do not. <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> Are you a food server? <laughs> uh, you guys yeah, are getting, it's getting worse. Yeah. Actually, I These questions up here. are getting further away. <laughs> yeah. Do you do something with the towel? No, oh, it's well, not oh, a towel. It's, it's a, a towel. Cloud. Okay, so there's okay. a hint. Yeah. Why don't you show the hint? Because okay, it's we'll been like two hint. minutes. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem we're getting, getting anywhere better. close. You guys are getting anywhere close. <laughs> here. This, in particular, is the oh, important yes. piece. Yes, there you right, go. So we got it. Got it. <laughs> You're one of the 13 kids. It's 11. It's actually, actually 11. But yeah. You close, we'll give that so to wait, you. So wait, just to be clear, <laughs> just to be clear, so the shirt, in case you didn't see, it says uh, SPDR. And that was enough for someone to say that you were one of the kids. So okay, well, who I, are the kids? What's going on? I'm, I'm going to do the unveil before okay. people start talking about platinum coins again. Um, or Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, so the Spy 11, also known as the Spy Kids, are 11 pretty random um, now millennials who have about $250 billion tied to them in the form of the world's biggest ETF, the SPDR, S&P 500 ETF, known by the ticker SPY. I still can't believe this is real. So what's the deal? <laughs> uh, well, basically, SPY was created as a unitary investment trust, um, partially because it would be easy to get through the SEC regulations. Um, at the time, to create this type of vehicle, they had to basically get two separate divisions of the SEC to uh, come together and approve it which if anybody's worked with regulators, that's incredibly what year was difficult. This? Oh gosh, it's, so it's probably around 93, 94 when this document was created. Um, I probably, more leading up into that, but I think probably late 80s, early 90s as well. But um, the, so basically what a unitary investment trust is, just to give a little legal background, is um, it's a vehicle that they put these investments into for this initial ETF um, that is connected to not only does it have a date limit to to go against the rule of perpetuities but they also have uh, measuring lives which is us 11 kids who are all kind of family members who are born around the time that this was created so um for example myself and two of my cousins who couldn't make it tonight are, are also on are part of the 11. But you didn't know that you were actually listed on this legal document until one of our reporters actually called you up. Yes. What was that conversation like? Did you think immediately that it was a scam? Uh, yes, actually. <laughs> I was like... Wait, was, this was just a few weeks ago? Yes, this was uh, probably mid-August, yeah. So you've gone your whole life yep. without knowing that the world's largest ETF, how much is in it now, quarter of a trillion dollars, is conti its continued existence is contingent on you and 10 other people being alive. Yes. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to get that clear. <laughs> and you found this out a few weeks ago. Yes. I mean, the, the lead-in email, it's like you're connected to this massive billion-dollar fund. I mean, that reads like any Nigerian <laughs> yeah. print scam. Like, what it, guys, you're getting real elaborate. Like, you know, businesses are giving this info away in these hacks. Like, why do you got to do all this? I'm still a little confused. <laughs> right? What was the legal requirement? I still don't know actually... Well, so I have a question on this because mm -hmm. you actually touched on it already, yes. the rule against perpetuities. Yep. Have you 
just become an expert in this in the past three or four weeks? Uh, a little bit. My um, So my mom, who put us on this list, was a actual Amex counsel at the time for the American Stock Exchange who kind of helped push and create this product. Um, and yeah, she, she, she kind of explained it to me. It's it's very it's basically to avoid having something that can go on in essentially perpetuity um you can't have any like for example a trust it could if you had it go on in perpetuity it can be doling out assets forever uh, in theory but that's why they have these rules in place to kind of uh limit these things and one of them is to use measuring lives uh and that's what we are essentially do you <laughs> resent that like they've made so much money on this and i assume you don't get anything i was that was my first question and yes <laughs> like, I was quite an, like am i do i get like a i don't know a royalty or anything yeah, yeah, yeah like a couple of spies yeah, yeah like come on does someone <laughs> i mean clearly not because you didn't know about this until mm -hmm. recently but how do they know that you're alive I, you know, that's funny. That that was a question we had. Like, who's tracking? Is there anybody tracking us? I, you know, <laughs> my cousin joked. It's like the born supremacy, yeah. where they have all like the faces and and the heartbeats going like on the screen and all. I, I don't think anybody did. I don't think anybody. So I think a thing to understand here: when this was all done, this was part of a 60-page legal document that was meant to be filed at the SEC and, like, lost forever. You know, it just would end up in some random government file. They weren't expecting these things to all be digitalized and put up on Edgar filings um, and easily searched by people on Twitter, apparently. Um, so, Not easily searched. I did that search, by the way. Well, somebody, I thought somebody, well, yeah. somebody had found it, right? Yeah, yeah. and sent it to us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it took a long time to, it took years for them to find it. Yeah. I'm, why were they so Actually, that person might <laughs> be here. That's my question. Today. <laughs> Who was it? Uh, I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, have you met the other Spy Kids? Are you all friends now? I like to think uh, that you're all going to go on vacation together. But and you think you're in the same room <laughs> together, right? Like, that seems like it would be like Let's a see. major <laughs> financial stability risk to have you on the same plane or the same building, right? Like. It, uh, yeah, it does not seem like a good idea. Um, no, actually, so two of them, uh, other names on the list, I don't know if, I mean, their their names are out there already, I guess. Pete and Paul Pavelka are my cousins, and they were also kind of born around the same time, so my mom thought, well, yeah, let's put them on there as well. <laughs> what do you actually, by the way, what do you do besides I work $250 in, billion dollars writing on you? So I actually work in public relations uh, for a financial PR firm, uh, M Group. Who's fake? I, uh, M Group, got to give the plug. Sorry. No uh, <laughs> you got to get something so it's out not, of Yeah, this. right? Um, so there's no, so it's not that weird that financial reporters reached out to me. It was kind of like, but the weird question was like, is your name Kevin Patrick McGrath? Now, I don't use my middle name on anything. Like, I think it's probably on two documents connected to me. And it's, so that was like, when I was like, what? Like, what is this all? Like, that was really the thing that ticked me off. I was like, what, where does this come from? <laughs> Are you putting it on your business card, Spy Kid? I uh, haven't yet, but I'm thinking about it. <laughs> also thinking about getting some identity protection services. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> if, if anyone wants to help crowdfund yeah. some identity uh, theft protection for Kevin, uh, who's full name and birth date is widely available. Um, we should probably do that. Can I just say, I'm, a, I'm extremely impressed that, like, how articulately you talk about, like, securities law and per, the law re relating to perpetuities and stuff like that, you know? I mean, I guess, like, you probably crammed after, like, discovering all this and want to learn everything, but I am very impressed. Oh, thank you. And, um, no, it's part of that. I mean, sure, I definitely read into it, but um, also just being around my mom my whole life, and she was just very uh, talked about work very well, openly. Oh, yeah, what did she say? So at some point, I assume you asked her, like, Mom? Yeah, like, so <laughs> before, I think maybe shortly before Rachel was able to contact me at work. Rachel is the Bloomberg sorry, reporter. Yes, correct. Um, she she had called my home and gotten my dad on the line. So he's like, call my, like, obviously this has to be connected to your mother. And I realized that once I saw someone sent me the filing, and I saw that it was Spy, and I had known Spider from, a ki from being a kid because obviously they had the really cool merch and spike, you know, as, a, as your eight-year-old kid, you go to like your parents, like the swag room at their office and you see like spiders. And I was like, oh, awesome. Like I'm grabbing all that. Um, You're perfectly made for odd lots, by the way. Yeah. If you think that's cool. <laughs> exactly. Um, and yeah, it was just kind of, I called her up and I was like, mom, like, did you do this? And she's like, 
did I do that? <laughs> she was. She did not remember. I mean, again, this was just a very. I thought it was going to be more like I knew one day this conversation. <laughs> yes. was I know that's the more exciting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But no, I think it was just, for them, it was very routine. It was just kind of like a call going around the office, like, hey, does anybody who had recently had kids or know somebody who had recently had kids who'd want to put their name on this fund? And All right. And now, now, now I'm on our fund. One of the 11. No yeah. pressure. Yeah. All right. Uh, Kevin McGrath, thank you so much for oh, coming on for and being our me. surprise thanks, guest. Thanks. And thanks, everyone, for playing the game. <laughs> And now it's time for the uh, first musical break of the evening. Uh, our guest today is America's foremost country singing economist. Possibly or economist, the only one. Country, maybe the only one. Uh, you might know him from his uh, smash hit that came out during the crisis, uh, Inflation or Deflation, which asked the crucial question, would we face, uh, would we be more like Zimbabwe or Japan? And so far I think uh, Japan is winning. Uh, he has some new numbers. Live from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, uh, Merle Hazard. Thank you, Joe and Tracy, for that very kind introduction. Your mic uh, on there? Howdy. All right. Uh, Y'all ready to hear some down home music about high finance? Well, my name is Merle Hazard, and that's Hazard with a Z as in zero interest rate policy. <laughs> the songs that I've done over the last 12 years or so since the crisis have been about uh, 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 economics, finance, banking, derivatives, uh, and asset-backed securities. They're songs about life. <laughs> And people do sometimes ask me how a country singer from Nashville could kind of get into that kind of thing. But to me, it really just comes natural. My daddy was a coal miner, and my mama was a supervisor in compliance at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. <laughs> now, this first song I want to do is on a monetary topic, and it, it's sen seniorage. And if I said seniorage, I'm not going to quiz anybody, but does that mean a lot, a little, or nothing to... Okay, so for some of you, it's a new topic. Basically, when a government produces its money supply, it makes a profit. Could be an emperor in ancient times, a king, queen, modern government. They could be uh, stamping coins with images. They could be printing paper. They could be doing it electronically. They make a profit. They use it in part to pay their army. And now central banks actually buy securities and make interest and dividends on this created money, and that's seniorage. So I figured that's a pretty good topic for a song. And uh, it's to the tune. I'm going to use an old melody you may recognize. It's by a guy named Harry Warren. He's been gone for decades. But um, Junior, you ready? Oh, I, this is my son, Merle Junior. <laughs> accompanying on guitar. <laughs> and uh, you ready to do that, Senor? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> All the money you print and the coins that you mint, that's seniorage. <laughs> On as much as you may, there's no interest to pay, that's seniorage. From the hills to the plains, like a dream of John Keynes, it's state income. Every central bank knows that as M0 grows, they can make some. Even gangsters with cash in an illegal stash, that's seniorage. For a central bank earns as the black market churns, this is true. Money's value is strange. It's a means of exchange and of storage. That is how central banks printing dollars and francs earn seniorage. Yes, seniorage. That's seniorage. Thank you. Thank you. What'd you think? It's a much better response than we got at the Cracker Barrel in Chattanooga. <laughs> it is. So I hope y'all are watching the PBS uh, series on country music that just started up. It's really good. And uh, uh, you know, I love Nashville, where I live and where Merle grew up, he lives here now. But, uh, uh, you know, Nashville, we've got Hot Chicken, we've got um, uh, the Grand Ole Opry, 
and we've got the headquarters of Alliance Bernstein. It's pretty much everything a man needs. Um, this, let's see, uh, you know, one thing I love about country music is you can take an idea, the kind of idea you wake up in the middle of the night, you might forget when you wake up or dimly recall, but if you write down a few words and make them rhyme, put a few chords on it, you've got something. Well, that's what I try to do with this next song, and it's called The Fed is Watching the Market. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> The Fed, oh, <laughs> we'll start here. The, the one, two, three, four. The Fed is watching the market. The market is watching the Fed. It's a game of follow the leader. But I can't tell which one is being led. The Fed is watching the market. The market's watching back in return. Fundamentals are in tatters. I'm not sure it even matters what companies possess or what they earn. The Fed is watching the market. They're trying to protect us from shocks when they speak of financial conditions. I'm thinking they really mean stocks. The Fed is watching the market. The market is returning its gaze. It makes some people wealthy, yet still it feels unhealthy when price and value part ways. The Fed believes in free markets, except not the market for cash. It helps to make bubbles more likely. When you cut rates at the first sign of a crash, the Fed is watching the market. But is there any bit of meat left in the soup? Incentives are perverse if valuation is recursive. We're caught in a financial feedback loop. Yes, we're caught in a financial feedback loop. Yes, we're caught in a financial feedback loop. Yes, we're caught in a financial feedback. I think you got the idea. Thank you. Thanks, all. Well, if you get, we're going to do one more song for you. And if you're getting into these songs, uh, check out the website, MerleHazard.com. There are songs on YouTube. There's some streaming things, uh, you know, Spotify and Apple Music, and even on iTunes. So if you've got, uh, the holidays are coming up, and if you've got colleagues at the financial firms where some of you work and they are intellectual and mildly depressed, I'm told this <laughs> will cheer them up. You may cement a friendship um, or get a promotion or something out of it. So this next song is about the, um, the statutory framework under which the Federal Reserve operates, the U.S. <laughs> Central Bank. Yeah, it's a good topic. Uh, so I respect central bankers. They have a really hard job in any country. I think they have an even, perhaps even harder job in the U.S. because the, the statute gives them two conflicting goals. And imagining myself in that position, I wrote this lament of the American central banker. Uh, which we'll finish up with, and the title is Dual Mandate. Junior. It's awfully hard to be a central banker. For rich folks like to see the currency strong. But the average Joe's not overjoyed if he's destitute and unemployed seems like every time I choose I'm choosing wrong the right says I should tighten up on credit not Donald Trump but most of the right to keep the risk of inflation nice and low while the left and many economic scholars are urging me to print more dollars I'm torn between two ways I could go. I've got a dual mandate, dual mandate. I gotta keep prices stable while giving jobs to those who are able. Dual mandate, dual mandate. My job is harder than you'll ever know. Unlike here in the U.S., the Bank of England has it relatively easy. Bank of England. And uh, so I hear, does Europe's ECB. European Central Bank. 
Their goal is for stable price. That's simpler and must be nice. A single mandate, unlike poor, unlucky me. Cause I've got a dual mandate. Dual mandate. I gotta solve labor's troubles without creating financial bubbles. Dual mandate. Dual mandate. It's tough for me to make our economy grow. My job is harder than you'll ever know. All right, thank you all very much. It's great to be here. Another round of applause for Merle Hazard. All right, well, we've come to the uh, final uh, interview of the uh, night. And um, I think unless you've been living under a rock over the last year or so, you've probably heard in the news a lot of uh, debate and discussion about modern monetary theory. Probably a lot of it um, has been caricature. It's like, ah, oh, they're the people who just say, print the money. They kind of do. Um, but also, so it's also kind of carica caricatured. Um, anyway, tonight we have with us the person who I think has done more than anyone else these, uh, these days to be a proponent and an advocate and a voice for MMT, and that is uh, Stephanie Kelton. She is a professor at Stony Brook. She's also an economic advisor to the Bernie Sanders campaign. And in addition to uh, talking a little bit about what MMT is, we're going to get her perspective on the state of the economy and economics right now because we live in interesting times, uh, large deficits by historical standards, very low interest rates by historical standards, and yet things aren't working. We're not having inflation like people would have expected. Wage growth has been poor. Uh, GDP growth across the developed world, very mediocre since the crisis. So I wanna, you know, economists are scratching their head. So looking forward to hearing how a uh, MMT economist uh, examines some of these puzzles of modern economic life. So, um, Stephanie Kellum. Whoops. I'm, break, I'm breaking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say when the people say that about MMT? They're like, oh yeah, just print the money. Well, it's you like, just said it. I yeah, said backstage. No, I, I said it. Is I said, that right? I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> What do I say? I, I don't know what else to say except, you know, what we've been saying for now two decades uh, and print well, the money. I thought it just started in the last couple of years. You guys have been at it for a while. We've been at it for a little while. And as far as I can tell, none of us has ever said MMT is about, you know, printing the money. But it gets shorthanded that way. Right. And it's like nails on a chalkboard. Every time I do an interview now, I sit down and I say, okay, we're going to do this on the understanding that you're not going to run a story that says MMT is about printing money. And so and we, we the do the interview and the headline reads, economist says, print more money. You know? Okay, so I'm, nothing I can do. I'm going to take the bait in that case. What is MMT about? And why has it suddenly sort of exploded into uh, maybe not entirely the public consciousness, but certainly um, this demographic? Well, it's like the impossible question to say, you know, what is MMT about? Because it's, uh, it's a group project that started more than two decades ago with um, maybe a half a dozen economists in the early years producing scholarship on questions from you know, the Eurozone to trade to social security to government finance to deficits to the, you know, I mean, it, it's this enormous project. So there's no way to just say, this is what MMT is in like a, you know, uh, a sound bite. But I think most people, when they think of MMT, they think of it as, um, an analytic framework, so it's a mac we're macroeconomists, so it's an analytic framework that tries to update the lens through which we um, understand the monetary system and the policy options that are available, I guess, in the post Bretton Woods, post gold standard era. And so we're basically saying, look, there's policy space that has opened up around us since we have gone off of the gold standard or fixed exchange rates, and we're not taking full advantage of that space. We could be doing better. And so 
we're trying to you know shine a light on some of those things so what was the impetus when when this first started was it that something has changed about either the financial system or the economy and we want to understand the existing world better or was it the policy prescription that you were after because i think nowadays lots of people hear mmt they think full employment they think universal health care that sort of thing Wh which was the inspiration behind it? I don't it. think it was either, actually. I mean, I think back to, you know, when I started training as an economist from undergrad, let's say, to graduate school, it was the mid-90s, and, you know, there were already different schools of thought out there. The post-Keynesians were saying very different things from more mainstream types of economists, and especially when it came to the financial system, to banking and finance and those sort of questions. So. Um, we were always kind of agitated by the way that mainstream economists describe how finance works in particular. So we had a different narrative set up from the very beginning. But then, you know, with MMT, I think it started evolving as we started to think differently about the role of taxes and the relationship between money and taxes and state finance. And it, it kind of opened up around the question of launching the euro. I think really, because we were looking at countries that were making a decision to abandon their currencies and adopt a, a common currency, and that sort of, I think, sparked hmm. the broader interest. So you mentioned that essentially it's an analytical framework, and as I mentioned in the intro, I think we're, people would agree, we're at a moment where a lot of people feel unsatisfied with the existing answers that economists have given, or that mainstream economists have given on things like, the recovery, why hasn't growth been faster? Why hasn't inflation picked up dis uh, despite cutting rates and these uh, trillion dollar deficits? What's your answer to that? What is the, you know, let's start with that. Why hasn't inflation picked up despite all these things that economists would have said, oh yeah, that'll definitely cause inflation? Well, I think the models are too mechanistic and they lead us to too simple an understanding of really complex phenomenon like inflation. And so if you're trained like I was maybe in the early years to think that, um, you know, money is uh, inflation is something that happens when you print too much money or, you know, the Milton Friedman inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So if you see central banks doing things like QE, and people say quantitative easing is printing money and printing money leads to inflation, then we all come to expect that. If you believe that inflation automatically picks up because the labor market gets tight and your market, uh, your, your model tells you that tight labor markets working through a Phillips curve sort of relationship lead to pressure on wages that then lead to increased pressure on price. It's basically the, the models are too simple and we have too much faith in them. Well, actually on that point, because I, I get the logic of this idea that, okay, unemployment falls, and then workers have more borrowing, uh, bargaining power, and then that leads to higher wages, and then they have more, um, you know, more purchasing power, and so on. What is the conceptual flow? Because we haven't even really seen robust wage growth by any stretch, even though the unemployment rate is below 4%. So just like breaking it down, like, why does even the most simple, seemingly logical idea that low unemployment would have all these... Uh, positive effects on prices. Why does that not even seem to be working? Well, I think most of it has to do with one key phrase that you just used, which is bargaining power. And how is bargaining power exercised? Through unions. And what's happened to unions over the course of the last 30 years? I mean, they've mostly been decimated. So it's pretty hard to tell a rational story about how even as the labor market tightens, workers are supposed to exercise the power in the negotiating process, if they don't have union representation, what are they supposed to do? Walk in and just sit down with the boss, kick their feet up on the table and say, I'm here for the raise, you know, labor market's tight, let's go. It's just not there. The, the, the mechanisms aren't in place for that to happen for, for huge swaths of the American workforce. Mm. So here's one thing I sometimes wonder, but if, if everyone in the US at least woke up tomorrow and accepted MMT as the analytical framework for the economy, what would change? Like, what would that world look like? And what would that change from the current scenario actually tell us about what's wrong with the way we think about economics I now? I mean, honestly, I think the biggest thing that changes is the conversation that we have. I mean, if, if we had a, a better set of lenses and we were able to see more clearly, mm. you know, the nature of the space around us, the monetary system, the way it works, I just think that a lot of the questions we ask today and a lot of the things that we presume stand in the way 
of you know Congress passing legislation that would do something more ambitious, like, well, we can't because trillion dollar deficits, or we can't because China has all this debt, or we can't because look what happened to Greece, or we can't, right? Um, at least that would go away, and then we would have a very different conversation. Even the tax cuts, right? If we were looking through an MMT lens and we said the Republicans are looking to do between a trillion and a half or two trillion, depending on how you want to cost it out, in tax cuts, instead of saying um, we can't afford it, it'll blow a hole in the budget and all this kind of stuff, we would have a different conversation. It would be about, you know, the presumed effectiveness in terms of job creation and the potential inflation risk in an economy that may or may not be closer to full employment. So I just think, you know, Social Security. Mm -hmm. Are we really going to have a conversation about the government's ability to keep its promise to future retirees, their dependents, and the disabled if we're not afraid of running out of money? Then the conversation changes. Then it becomes about demographics and inflation risk. And I just think we have a, a richer, more substantive national debate than this, you know, arbitrary, frivolous conversation about, you know, entitlements driving us into a debt crisis, which is now, silly. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, you are on one of the teams in the primary, and you may, uh, speaking of, like, the sound of, like, screeching chalkboards, how much does it hurt you when you hear Democratic candidates blast the tax cuts on the grounds that it blew out the deficit? It, it does, but I haven't heard that much of it. And so you're encouraged. I'm encouraged. You know what? It's funny, Joe, because what I hear Democrats saying is that they would like to repeal all or much of the Republican tax cuts, not because they blew a hole in the deficit and we got to repair that damage, but because they want to use those tax cuts to, quote, pay for something else. In other words, it's the same as saying, I want to use the deficit to build infrastructure. It's no different. It's tantamount to saying, I want to keep the deficit, but I want to direct it mm. towards some other aim, right? I mean. So even though we have some Democrats complaining about Republicans expanding the deficit for very specific purposes, there are quite a few high profile Democrats who seem to be embracing MMT, whereas Republicans who actually have a de facto history of, of, blow, embracing, MMT. <laughs> of embracing MMT haven't done that. Why do you think that is? You mean openly invoking? No. Or? So they'll expand the deficit for their pet projects yes. um, in a sort of MMT way, but they, they don't seem to embrace the theory in the way that some Democrats Well, have. it's better to embrace it actively than to embrace it rhetorically. So I guess I'd, in some sense, you know, it's more encouraging to see someone pushing through an agenda um, that doesn't hew to the hysteria around debt and deficits. Is this my preferred um, set of policies? No. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's not as if it's encouraging just because a few Democrats have invoked MMT because at the same time, you know, the Speaker of the House has reinstated PAYGO, and that's not terribly encouraging if you're looking at the potential to take the House and the Senate and then move ambitious progressive legislation. You're not going to do it in an environment in which PAYGO is in place, which is a rule that uh, exists in the House of Representatives today that says you can't add to the deficit. So everything has to be deficit neutral. So, mm. I mean, it's, it's good and bad. It's, there's progress for sure being made. Now, one of the uh, policy agendas that's likely to be on the plate of a theoretical democratic administration, particularly if it's of the more uh, progressive wing or if it, if it is uh, Bernie, would be a, uh, a Green New Deal. And something that you hear people say is like, some people are like, well, how can we afford it? And the response is often, well, you know, we didn't ask that question. We didn't, we didn't choose to fight the world wars based on whether we could afford to. We figured out a way to do it. So what are the lessons from the wars, and I mean, I think Keynes wrote a pamphlet, How to Pay for the War, that apply today towards something as ambitious as a Green New Deal? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that Keynes's little book, which it was called uh, How to Pay for the War, that's literally the title of the little pamphlet, and you would think just based on the name of it that this must be a book about where to get all the money to finance World War II. And this is, Keynes was a British economist, of course, so this was, you know, advice for the British government. And it turns out, you read this thing, and it has nothing to do with where the British government is going to get all the money to finance the war effort. It's about understanding that this is going to be a massive endeavor, that it's going to involve transforming the economy away from one that's oriented around producing for the consumer to one that's oriented around 
winning the war, right? Transforming the, the entire economy. And Keynes was mindful of the inflation risks because the government was gonna have to ramp spending way up. And in order to do that, it was gonna have to take resources away from other uses. And so you're elbowing out the private sector in order to bring people and industries into public service and to orient you know, for the war effort. So the whole book is about how to do that in a way that avoids, to the extent possible, creating an inflation problem. And it turns out it was really effective. It was a very careful analysis of how to allow the government to spend into the economy while removing enough purchasing power strategically, right? It was really important to Keynes that you remove the purchasing power from the right hands, because if you remove purchasing power from the wrong hands, you might not do much to mitigate the inflation risk. In other words, if all you do is tax the very richest people who weren't gonna spend much of that money in the first place, then you run the risk of a real inflation problem. So he understood that this had to be done really strategically. So with the Green New Deal, same thing, right? The same principle applies. If you're gonna do something that is truly transformative, that you're not just talking about tr um, transforming the way we deliver energy, but the way we build housing and transportation and the way we deal with food production, agriculture, you're gonna to touch nearly every piece of the US economy. And so the lesson is to look back at what Keynes told us and to figure out if you're gonna go that big and you're gonna make that kind of investment in the US economy over a short period of time, 10 years or so, right? Um, that there are important lessons to learn from what Keynes was doing in that little pamphlet, and inflation is the major risk, not bankruptcy or financing. So this sort of connects with one of the criticisms that you often hear about MMT, which is it's actually not that different to Keynesianism in various ways. How would you respond to that? How, how would you lay out the differences explicitly? Well, I think there are a lot of them, and you're right. I mean, there are examples like the one I just gave, where I'm saying basically, um, when it comes to the Green New Deal, listen to Keynes. Okay, that was about inflation risk. But um, there are very substantive differences between the way that we analyze some big questions and the way that some headline Keynesians, I mean, I don't know how much I want to pick on certain people and give uh, specific examples. I was a a contributor at Bloomberg for a period of time. I got into a little back and forth with Paul Krugman. We traded some columns, him in the New York Times, me writing for Bloomberg. And um, there we teased out, I think, some of the important differences. I mean, you know, the conventional Keynesian models tell you that deficits are supposed to drive interest rates up. That's mm -hmm. the way it works in normal times. And that when the government increases its deficit, it has to increase borrowing. And as it borrows more, that gobbles up private savings that are no longer available to finance private investment, leaving um, companies with fewer resources to invest. And so investment goes down. And as investment goes down, you get a slower growing, more lethargic economy. MMT, this is just one example. Mm -hmm. But MMT says, no, 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 hang on. Deficits don't gobble up savings, they augment savings. If the government spends $100 into the economy and only taxes $90 back out, we label that a government deficit. But what we forget is that I just deposited $10 mm -hmm. into some part of the economy. My deficit, if I'm government, I'm Uncle Sam, my deficit becomes a surplus in some other part of the economy. So from the very beginning of this crowding out story where deficits become the villains of progress in the economy, MMT says, no, no, hang on. You're getting it wrong from that very first step, right? Deficits add to savings. And then we could go on about the relationship between interest rates and investment. They think that they are obviously inversely related. We say interest rates are policy variable, not something determined by market forces, or at least they always can be. So they're just, we go on and on. Another uh, thing that people say about MMT is that, uh, they're like, well, yeah, sure, because the U.S. is the world's reserve currency, so the U.S. has a lot of policy flexibility. Other countries uh, don't have it. But I, I don't know if, how much you were paying attention. We were talking about Argentina. What is the sort of MMT? If you were, you know, if, if Macri had brought in you instead of the IMF and said, what should I do to make my economy more stable, what, have, what would have been the, uh, the MMTers advice? Well, I mean, the, I think the last discussion was, was really good and very much on point in many ways in the sense that to the extent that you're able to avoid doing so, you should avoid borrowing in a foreign currency. And not every country has the capacity to unilaterally just say, I am not going to the international markets at all. I'm only borrowing in my own currency. Some countries can't do that. But 
Argentina could do less of that, and that would be advisable um, for for a start. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the the reserve currency status gives us an additional degree of freedom. There is, you know, an extra benefit to being the re the world's reserve currency. But you know, I was just in Japan not too long ago, and Japan, I heard. yeah, there was a controversy about that. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, I don't know for a. <laughs> Let's not. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. not. Okay. Um, right, now I'm not really worth curious. the oxygen. It's on the internet. Um, but but there's a country that is not the world's reserve currency that um, has a debt to GDP ratio. If you go gross terms of like 240 percent, right? And I, I go over there, and the biggest question I got from all all of Japanese press, everyone I talk to, how do we get inflation? What can we do to cause inflation? Like they're desperate to create inflation. Their debt ratio is the you know highest in the world. Interest rates are right where the Bank of Japan puts them. Are very low. Inflation's mm -hmm. low. It's just you know. Oh. Wait, but before you go, I'm not going to say. I, I know we're not going to get into the controversy, but for those <laughs> curious, there I discovered through learning about this, there is a libertarian caucus within the Democratic Socialists of America. I didn't know that either. <laughs> but if you g Google some of those keywords together, you'll figure out what's going on. I had no idea, Tracy. Well, now I've completely forgotten what Sorry. I was about to ask. <laughs> now I just want to know about the caucus. Pick um, a topic. Uh, well, actually, I was going to ask about um, some of the chaos that we've seen in money markets this week. Mm. Um, and part of that was said to have been caused by this ramp up in T-bill issuance by the government, um, which sort of bled through into money markets. I, I guess I'm curious. How much does MMT sort of reflect on the existing banking system and, and regulations when it comes to gauging its own impact? Oh, I mean, I mean, I think that the if you ask me what's the greatest strength of MMT, mm. you know, I'll be a little bit brazen here. I think we've gotten all the big stuff right. There's nothing that has been major that we've gotten wrong. Nothing. Mm. I don't. I, I think it's in a pretty impeccable record, and I think the strength is that we have a superior understanding of monetary operations. And that is we dig deep into the weeds on some of this stuff, monetary operations, that other people kind of superficially understand, but MMTers are really in the weeds. So you're both very on Twitter, uh, very online, and you probably saw some of the conversation from folks in the MMT community. Nathan is sitting over there. Scott Fulweiler, uh, Rowan Gray, these guys were tweeting out. You know, I was trying to write a book, and so trying as much as possible not to get uh, too involved in what was happening mm -hmm. with, you know, financial markets in the last couple of days and Fed uh, interventions and so forth. But these guys were all over it in a deep way. And yeah, we have a DM group that we were all going back and forth and trying in real time to, you know, make full sense of it because um, it's very much in the weeds. Mm -hmm. Well, more generally, so we don't, you know, get too in the weeds on uh, the operations of money markets and the repo markets, which I don't even understand myself. Uh, just generally speaking, what is it, what do you make of like sort of mainstream Fed policy? Do rate cuts boost, stimulate the economy? It depends. It depends where you are in and in which cycle. I think. I mean, so you right know, now we've embarked on yet another cutting cycle. We don't know how long it's going to be, but uh, since the summer, the Fed for the first time since uh, before the crisis has cut again twice now. Is that the kind of action that? you think could have a uh, positive uh, impact on the economy? No, I mean, not much. It, 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 it's unlikely to do a lot of harm. If Warren Mosler were sitting here, he'd say they've got the brake and the gas pedals mixed up. In other words, um, Warren has for a long time, this is a sort of founding father of MMT, so for those that aren't familiar with the name, Warren actually makes the argument, and I think Randy Ray does as well. It's a pretty compelling argument if you actually do. I wrote a paper on this when uh, I was a lot younger and published it. And there's some empirical support for the idea that central banks, when they raise interest rates, they think they're tightening. When they cut interest rates, they think they're easing. They think it stimulates the economy to, to lower rates. But in some countries where the debt is very large, interest is somebody's income, right? Bondholders receive interest as income. And raising rates as bonds are rolled over and interest rates are going up is, is, is tantamount to fiscal expansion. In other words, it's an increase in income, right? Interest income. So there is the possibility that raising interest rates has uh, a stimulative effect. Now, against that, obviously, credit becomes more expensive. So 
interest sensitive sectors like home buying and durable goods like automobiles and stuff maybe people borrow less to buy a home or a car in an environment in which interest rates are rising but to think that this one price in the entire US economy the overnight interest rate the Fed's policy tool one price that if they just move it 25 basis points here and 25 basis points there that they can steer this enormous economic ship called the United States economy is pretty much a stretch <laughs> for me. So, you know, but that's it. That's what we believe. That's what economists right. believe, right? The Fed, the dual mandate song, it will go through your head tonight, right? <laughs> the dual mandate. The Fed's got a dual mandate, and they're supposed to use this one price and make these modest adjustments to bring about, you know, a broad equilibrium in the economy where we get low inflation and high levels of employment and growth. It's, so one thing we're hearing a lot about now, to the point where it's become a cliche, is that fiscal policy is the new monetary. And Joe and I heard this several times today al alone. It, it, is that the right direction? Or do you worry that we're just going to assume that any form of fiscal stimulus is going to be the, the panacea that we've been seeking? Well, look, I think that you know this is textbook stuff, right? There are two levers. If you're doing macroeconomic policy, uh, you, you either pull the monetary policy lever, which is conventional policy, tweaking the interest rate, or you pull the fiscal policy lever, and that's taxes and government spending. And for the last 30 years, we have leaned extremely heavily on central banks, not just here in the U.S., but around the world, right? The central banks were the only game in town. Fiscal policy is that thing that sits behind the glass with the break in case of emergency cover on it. And central banks are supposed to, to steer economies, right? Um, and that hasn't worked all that well for 30 years. You know, Larry Summers says the last three expansions in the US were bubble driven. I mean, all three, right? The last from the savings and loan to the um, subprime to the dot com in the 1990s. So that's kind of how we do it. And now everybody's sort of waking up to this idea that there's another lever that we, we have to become more reliant upon. But does that mean that any fiscal policy is good fiscal policy and it all has good effects? No. You know, it's got to be well, targeted that, and. We just have a few moments left, but I think this is one of the main things. They say, yeah, it makes sense that uh, fiscal policymakers should run the show more often in terms of demand management, but then they look at what that means, and no one actually looks at D.C. right now and thinks, oh, this is a Congress that is capable of working with a president that could deliver anything meaningful in any period of time or timely manner. That seems like a real problem just from a practical standpoint, that it's all nice to say that fiscal policy is the lever that should be pulled, but that applies politics for better or worse, is there, how do you address that concern? That it's like, okay, maybe monetary policy is not that effective, but at least they could do something. Well, so I know how I, I would address it by putting it on automatic pilot to a large extent. In other words, take the responsibility away from Congress to act in real time to make smart um, decisions with tax policy and spending, and to do that through a federal job guarantee, which is to say, that in the last downturn, you know, we were losing 800,000 jobs a month at the height of the Great Recession. And if we had had um, uh, something in place, a program in place to absorb workers into employment instead of allowing them to fall into unemployment, it would have provided a cushion for the economy to recover more quickly. So, you know, Janet Yellen, uh, several years ago at Jackson Hole, the big meeting that takes place between Fed officials and invited academics and others, um, she said we need to strengthen the automatic stabilizers. We need better automatic stabilizers. And a federal job guarantee is like turbocharging the automatic stabilizers we have today. And I, that's what I would do. Stephanie Kelton, thank you very much. Thank you for We've having me. We've tried so long. We've tried a bunch of times to actually get right, you to come yeah. on the podcast itself, so I'm glad we finally uh, made it happen. I'm glad, too. Thank Thanks you Thanks for much. having me. All right, uh, our, our next act is the, the last of the evening. Um, it's, it's someone you've probably never heard of before. Um, in addition to being a genius at poker, a polymath, an expert in Chinese food, 
and the provider of original insights into everything from economics to finance, markets, philosophy, and trade. He also has musical abilities on the level of a Bob Dylan or a Van Morrison. <laughs> He's also the best colleague anyone could ever ask for, despite writing his own introduction and making me repeat it here. <laughs> yes, it is time for the musical stylings of Mr. Joe Weisenthal. Right. I'm just going to play a few songs, um, but I'm really intimidated now after having watched uh, Merle play, but I wrote a few songs about markets and economics. This first one um, is, uh, is about uh, one of my favorite lessons from markets, which is that um, no matter how bad things get in life, uh, one of the lessons that markets tells us is that they can get infinitely worse. You can always go to zero. <laughs> Well, I met the old trader in the pits of Chicago And where I'd be without him, heaven only knows Cause he taught me the lesson I still think about today And anytime I'm feeling down, I think of what he'd say Well, I told him I was gonna buy a stock Cause it went down so much And I said it's gonna rebound And I'm gonna make a bunch He said, I hope you get your money Yes, I hope you get your cash But there's a simple lesson That's of use in life and math No matter how hard you fall No matter how low you get You can always go down another hundred percent no matter how hard you fall, no matter how low you get, you can always go down another hundred percent. Well, I heard you're doing badly and you're trying to get well. Well, I heard you're in the valley and you're trying to climb the hill. Well, I hope, well, I think that you'll do better. Yes, I really think you will. But there's a simple lesson that I'm trying to instill No matter how hard you fall, no matter how low you get You can always go down another hundred percent Well, I think about life's journeys and all its ups and downs And all the hidden corners that I couldn't see around and sometimes it's like I'm swimming and I'm trying not to drown. And I think about the lesson I learned in Chicago town. No matter how hard you fall, no matter how low you get, you can always go down another hundred percent. Well, I saw that trader years ago and he was looking frail. He made a fortune trading cotton, then he lost it leaning on the rail. He said it really don't matter much, you just got a few years left. And it don't matter how high's your pile when you're facing death. No matter how hard you fall, no matter how low you get, you can always go down another hundred percent. Thank you. So, uh, so one of my favorite characters in the world of financial markets are um, charlatans who sell newsletters where they claim that they like predict the future, and they get people to subscribe, and they're like, oh, I predicted all this, and I predicted all that, and I fight with them a lot, and you know, you should never subscribe to their newsletters. Um, so I wrote a song about them, and uh, I, just, I dedicate this song to all the charlatans in the audience tonight. <laughs> I knew bad things were gonna happen. I knew the bombs were gonna fall. I knew the stocks were gonna crash and I tried to warn you all. Now listen, my friends, I get no joy from being right. But if you wanna know what happens next, you gotta pay me for my next insight. Fifty dollars a year is really not that bad to know the things that I'm knowing. Fifty dollars a year is really not that bad To know the way that we're gone 
I knew bad things were gonna happen. I knew the bombs were gonna fall. I knew the stocks were gonna crash, and I meant to warn you all. Now listen, my friends, I get no joy from being right. But if you want to know what happens next, you gotta pay me for my next insight. I predicted Brexit and President Trump. I know which way the wind is blowing. I predicted the mortgage meltdown and Amazon's melt up. I can see the seeds we're sowing. I knew bad things were gonna happen. I knew the bombs were gonna fall. I knew that stocks were gonna crash and I tried to warn you all. Now listen, my friends, I get no joy from being right. But if you wanna know what happens next, you gotta pay me for my next insight. Some say I'm a genius, but that's really not it at all. I just know where to look. And if you wanna know all the things that I know, you've got a lot of, you gotta read a lot of ancient Greek books. Some say I'm clairvoyant, but that's really not it at all. I just know where to look. And if you want to know all the things that I know, just download my free ebook. All right, it is my last song, and um, so I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and he was like recommending that I listen to like some singer that um, he, re he liked, and he's like, oh, his songs are really class conscious. And I said, well, what does that mean? Like, which class? And he's like, well, the working class, obviously. And then it occurred to me as soon as he said that, like, no one ever writes a folk song for the shareholder class. <laughs> um, seems unfair. Um, so I wrote a, a folk song for the shareholder class. It's called the, uh, the Shareholder Blues. Well, for many years, I've been buying stock and all the money that I made I deserved. But lately I haven't been doing so hot and I blame it on the Federal Reserve. And the working man, he wants more pay and a bonus of a thousand large ones. And I'd like to say that it's okay just as long as it don't eat into margins. Hey, my friend, hey, my friend, haven't you heard the news? I've been coming down with a bad case of the shareholder blues. Well, I bought a stock and it doubled in just a hundred days. But that wasn't long enough to be eligible for the long-term capital gain. <laughs> so I held on to it just hoping that I could pay less tax. But you can guess what happened next. The stock gave the gains right back. Hey, my friends, hey, my friends, haven't you heard the news? I've been coming down with a bad case of the shareholder blues. Now these are tough times for everyone. Student loan debt burden on the young. And the low interest rates don't help as you get older. And there ain't no raises for the working man as soon as they pay Uncle Sam. And nobody gives a damn about the struggling shareholder. Hey, my friend, hey, my friend, haven't you heard the news? I've been coming down with a bad case of the shareholder blues. Now the newspapers say the economy's booming, but we all know it's sick. But if, you've got, if you listen to me, I've got a few ideas and we can make this economy tick. But if you enact the policies that me and my friends don't like, we're gonna bring the economy to its knees when we go on a capital strike. Hey, my friend, hey, my friend, haven't you heard the news? 
I've been coming down with a bad case of the shareholder blues. Thank you.